Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming today. I'm very excited to be here and talk to you. Hi, Mom, also. Um, so, okay. My name is Neta Mishli. I'm a human rights attorney uh, from Israel, and I'm an MA student at the Global Studies Program at UNC. Today, I will be talking to you about an issue that is very close to my heart, migration and migrant women's uh, vulnerability to intimate partner violence. Um, before we start, I do want to note that intimate partner violence does exist and affect men as well, and also in same-sex couples, of course. Um, but this was not part of my research, so I won't be addressing uh, this phenomenon today. Uh, okay. So, take a minute to process the harsh statements that you see um, on the screen. Uh, they reflect the harsh reality that some of my former clients, women who migrated to Israel uh, from different places found, uh, and found themselves in unbearable situations. To better understand my background and connection to the subject, I became interested in the intersection of migration and intimate partner violence after I represented several women uh, in, who escaped abusive relationships in application to adjust their migration status. During these proceedings, I've noticed that beyond the status adjustment, um, these women face significant and unique difficulties, which make the already hard step of exiting an abusive relationship almost impossible. As part of my MA thesis, I try to understand why that is the case and what can be done about it. To do so, I collected and analyzed existing literature, collected data, from different non-governmental organizations and conducted interviews with nine professionals, attorneys, and social workers who work with migrant women. My presentation will proceed as follows. First, I will talk about trends in international migration. Then, about the general phenomena of intimate partner violence. Third, I will share some of the characteristics that make migrant women especially vulnerable to intimate partner violence. And lastly, we will talk about solutions. Based on the most recent Organization for International Migration report, women's migration has increased between 2019 and 2020 to make 48% out of the international migrant population of 281 million people. Generally speaking, people migrate mainly to improve their living conditions, for school, and due to familial relationships. A smaller percentage of migrants do so to escape persecution, conflict, and other disasters. Gender-based violence is legally recognized as a form of persecution, but the law often fails women who migrate under these circumstances. and controlling behaviors by an intimate partner is estimated to be the most widespread form of violence against women globally. Almost one in three women who ever had an intimate relationship um, had experienced violence in, in, uh, in an intimate setting. Um, this is a very hard statistic to process, understanding that while for many of us, home means a sense of stability and care. For others, it is a place that fosters fear and pain. While intimate partner violence exists in every society, every social class, its prevalence does vary significantly globally and nationally across communities. Migrants and migrants' communities are very general terms, referring to people with different backgrounds, resources, and cultures. Given this wide variety of cases, it is not surprising that studies conducted in different countries with significant migrant communities show that migration doesn't make migrant women categorically more likely to experience violence, but rather it exacerbates um, their vulnerability and their, entraps them in abusive relationships. So it makes the process of um, getting out or mitigate the violence within the relationship harder. Why is that? Um, this slide presents some of the answers. First, language barriers. 
Language barriers are almost integral to the experience of migration. They affect migrant women's ability to reach out for assistance, to learn about their rights, and to create significant social networks that are an important source of support. In addition, they allow abusive spouses to situate themselves as the main and only source of information about their migrant partner's migration status and rights. Isolations from families and friends. Migrant women have fewer social resources to rely on. They usually have left their friends and families behind, and creating a new support system in a foreign place is something that takes time. Isolating victims to ensure their dependency in the abusive spouse is a common characteristic of intimate partner violence. The experience of migration makes this process of isolating your spouse easier and more hermetic. Economic dependency. Migrant women who face intimate partner violence, especially as mothers, are often economically dependent on their spouse. Even if they are able to reach out for assistance and gain access to a shelter, the challenge of um, getting economic independence, of being incorporated into the labor market, and being able to collect child support contributes to significantly to their return to their abusive spouse especially if they do not hold a legal permit to work. Migration law in itself is a major factor that affects uh, women, especially when the reason for migration is to marry a citizen. So when women's eligibility for migration status derives from their marriage to a citizen. Um, in that situation, the citizens hold a significant power over their head. Not only they can exploit any of the previous factors that I mentioned to further their control, but they could also threaten the, the woman's ability to stay in the country by refusing to collaborate with the status adjustment process, leaving them to choose between deportation and enduring the abuse. And then finally, uh, men and women who were brought up in patriarchal societies tend to show greater acceptance to the use of violence against women in intimate settings. In such communities, women are less likely to place the blame for the harm that they suffered on their partner, both internally and externally. So many countries develop different programs to assist women in rehabilitation from their exposure to intimate partner violence. However, in the case of migrant women, their unique vulnerabilities often make such program less or completely irrelevant. For example, if a woman does not have a permit to work, she will not be able to make use of existing vocational training programs for victims of intimate partner violence. Um, so there, these programs that target local women do not always cater the needs, the special needs of migrants. So what can we do about it? To overcome migrant women's particular hardship in the context of intimate partner violence, we first have to learn. We have to collect data on the national level about the scope of the phenomena in different communities. Intimate partner violence is generally known to be underreported. Migrants, and especially undocumented migrants, are even less likely to report the abuse they suffered. While conducting my research in Israel, I saw that the country really invests no effort in collecting and analyzing data from different relevant sources, like the police, hospitals, and the Ministry of Interior. The second thing we have to do is to advocate for tailored migration policies. In the US, for example, as part of the Violence Against Women Act, victims of spousal abuse can apply for status independently from their citizen spouse. A similar provision was recently accepted as part of the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. But it, we are still far from the day where no one will have to choose between abuse and deportation. The third thing we need to do is to advocate for intervention programs that are adjusted and catered to meet the particular needs of migrant women. A woman that arrives in a shelter but finds herself isolated due to the language barriers she experienced 
um, is unable to gain the support she needs. As one of the social workers I talked to explained to me, she came after experiencing a horrible trauma, and instead of feeling welcome, she feels misunderstood. Another example that came up in my research is that in women, uh, in women's shelters in Israel, women are eligible for financial aid uh, from the state, um, which is not, which uh, migrant women are not eligible to. Um, some shelters uh, were able to fundraise so they can match or at least partially match um, these financial sources to support migrant women. Um, in the past few years, advocacy work did open the door to increase financial support from the state in particular situations. So uh, for migrants who are considered legally unremovable. This change has enabled more women to complete their time in the shelter and gradually gain independence when they went back to the community. And then the last thing, uh, we need to increase access to information. If women can adjust their status independently from their spouse, they need to be informed about it and about any other service that is available to them because lack of information is a significant uh, problem. Thank you very much. I hope you found this uh, presentation insightful.